My name is Ben, and I work in UNDP together with Bernardo, Ranka, Liza, and Raquel in the innovation facility. We host those talks quite frequently, and what we want to do is want to bring in people from the outside who do things that are not yet done within the UNDP as inspiration. Today we have the pleasure of having Andy with us in Flowminder. Flowminder is one of the leading outfits in terms of sourcing new data sources and making it work monitor the SDGs and just get a better grip on how can we leverage what's out there in terms of data to get real-time updates on the work that we do in its effects. And just like an invitation for the UDP colleagues here, if you're inspired by this or any other talk, we are on the 16th floor, always have an open door, if you have the key. <laughs> <laughs> but come work with us. Have a look at unipedal.org slash innovation, our um, annual review points out a couple of initiatives that we kicked off. And when I say we, that's not the HQ-based team, that's our innovation champions in the country offices who make the action happen. But some of them leverage new data sources and others other innovation approaches, some behavioral insights, doing co-creation processes. But we are always eager to explore new partnerships within the organization and also first with others. But that's just the plug. The shameless part of our team. Now I hand over to Andy. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, I'm going to give an overview of the kind of work we do within uh, Worldpop and Flowminder. So we're a group of around 40, 50 people um, based mainly at the University of Southampton. Um, I guess our, our main focus is on mapping, identifying vulnerable populations in, in low and middle income countries. Um, and you're an idea of the kind of work we do. Um, so some context first. Okay, so yeah, recent years we've seen substantial improvements in global development metrics, under five deaths, infant deaths, neonatal deaths, all declining in the last 15 years. Uh, life expectancy going up in, in all regions as well. GDP, everyone's getting healthier, richer. Um, but inequalities still exist um, between countries in terms of health and wealth. Um, perhaps importantly, subnational inequalities exist as well. Um, so yeah, this is a map showing the under five mortality rate between the, the worst and best regions in different countries. Um, there can be some huge differences. Um, so if we're thinking about national level statistics, which is what the Millennium Development Goals were based on, um, that can mask a lot of inequalities. Um, as examples where MDG indicators could be passed, and could be achieved by a country just by improving the health or wealth of the people in the main city and neglecting everyone else in the country. So because of that, uh, the SDGs came along and have some quite different wording from the Millennium Development Goals about leaving no one behind, no goal should be met unless it's met for everyone, um, endeavoring to reach the furthest behind first, and focus on achieving the goals everywhere. So I'm a geographer, so I would say that geography is important, um, but it's um, very much a focus on understanding uh, things subnationally and being able to identify where those furthest behind are to be able to target them and, and meet those goals. So all of the SDGs are based on ensuring a certain percentage of the population has access to services or achieves a certain level of social, economic, or physical health. So we need to know where those populations are, who those populations are, how many there are to provide that denominator. Um, and an improved understanding of subnational geographic variation, inequity, and health status, wealth, um, as I mentioned, is increasingly recognized as pretty central to meeting these goals that we're going to achieve from everywhere. Um, so this requires us to have some kind of consistent, comparable, regularly updated understanding of not only how many people live in a country, where those people are, and who they are uh, in terms of their, their demographics and um, factors about them that are related to the SDGs. So census data has typically provided us and continues to provide us with that baseline data. Um, and when it's, when it's good, reliable, recent census data, it's a very good source. So this is from northern Namibia, 
Uh, every single very small admin unit there has an, a number of people assigned to it. It has age, <laughs> gender structures. Um, we can have repeated censuses in countries to get an idea of how things are changing through time. Um, there can be information on migration as well, asking questions of where did, where did you live a year ago. So that's great. And in high income countries, it's even better. We have regular reliable censuses. We also have civil registration vital statistics that can update those continually, and multiple other sources of survey statistics. Um, it's not so good in the low and middle income countries where we are reliant a lot on the census data. Um, so it has problems, even in that good data example, that was 2011, it's five years now in an area where demographics change fast. Um, more typically, in terms of mapping the data, we have this kind of situation, this is Central African Republic, where the data is only uh, available, aggregated at very large uh, units. And in, in some cases, it's even worse. So we have this broad swath of yellow, which is six to 10 years since the last census, and a lot more have changed since then. And these yellow, uh, these orange and red countries, it's even worse. Now, Afghanistan, 1979, the last census, and it was only 60% of the population. Uh, Democratic Republic of Congo was 1984, Somalia, 1986. Um, so the challenge here is that national census data is going to continue to be our main source for these SDGs. Um, it provides the denominators and numerators uh, for all the SDGs and gives us subnational detail. Um, but uh, even in the best situations, uh, uh, in the SDG period, we typically only have just one census data point. So from 2015 to 2030, we have a census in 2020, we may not get the data till 2022 or something. Uh, 2030, we may have a census, again, yeah, maybe a long time until we get that data. Um, so how do we get that baseline? How do we monitor progress in between? Um, and in many situations, the countries we're focused on here, the situation is even more challenging where we really don't know how many people there are in some settings. Um, how this, uh, just uh, digging a bit deeper how this actually affects uh, on the ground applications. So here's a, an example that um, working with the Gates Foundation in northern Nigeria aiming for polio elimination, which uh, looks like it's been achieved. But the aim here is to vaccinate as close to 100% of under five as possible. So to do that, we need to ensure the correct amount of vaccine is available. So we need to know how many under fives there are across the region. We need to plan the local vaccination vaccine needs. We need to know how those numbers of under fives change, how they are disaggregated locally. And then planning the vaccinated logistics and routes. We need detailed maps of the region. So uh, in an area like this, that's, that's great <coughs> in terms of subnational data. Here we are in Google Maps. We have every <laughs> single building mapped out. We have restaurants, street names. If we go to the biggest city in northern Nigeria, one of the biggest cities in Africa, right in the center of Kano, we have a few street names and some brown and gray blobs, and that's about it. If we go just a few miles, in this case, I think it was east from here, just to some suburb, we still have every single building mapped. If we go a few, the same number of miles away from the center of Kano, where we know there's lots of people, there's, there's nothing on Google Maps. Um, and these are the kind of maps that uh, Gates Foundation and polio elimination efforts had to work with. So this is one of the one of the good ones. Um, it's more like uh, more likely you get maps like this, like this uh, stuck to the wall, but, uh, and this is uh, perhaps <laughs> as bad as it gets. Um, and not only are the, the maps um, had to be used for vaccination planning, um, so we have there's quite a good one here. Perhaps. Uh, being able to divide up the different vaccination teams uh, to cover these different regions. The problem was when they took a GPS unit and drove around the edge of that border, that's actually what it looks like. So Team 17 has some, some problems. Um, and also the numbers. So they were based on projections from the 2006 census. Um, interestingly, the bigger your population, 
was the more money you got from the government. Which, so, by the way, the 2006 census UNDP conducted. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> there was a few anomalies in here, uh, like this, where from the satellite data you see 36 compounds, 32 compounds. But the, uh, the numbers this one suggest there's some inflation going on there. So what do we have to try and help fix this? Um, so what I will talk about throughout this is geolocated household surveys. So these can fill in some of the gaps here. Three to five years conducted in low middle income countries. Satellite and GIS data, obviously collected all the time pretty much. And mobile phone data, again, collected all the time. So I'll go through each of those data sets. Um, household surveys. Um, over a uh, core data source for monitoring the, the Millennium Development Goals and also the, the SDGs and typically used like this. This is 53.1% of women are literate in Nigeria. Um, they can be broken down subnationally. We now see this kind of north-south gradient, um, but we know there's a lot of heterogeneity within those regions as well. And what can help us uh, start to get at that heterogeneity is nowadays most national surveys take with them uh, GPS, uh, Global Positioning Systems. So each cluster of households has a, a location. And that means we can get to this kind of picture of a proportion of women who are illiterate in this case. And immediately we see much more heterogeneity here. These gray areas are urban areas. So we can see higher rates of literacy in the urban areas than the remote rural areas. Um, and this kind of data source is available across most of the low and middle income countries. So problems are it's small sample sizes and it's only a, a very small section of areas. So I'll talk about ways we can use this data later. Um, we also have GIS data. So this beforehand, this is Haiti, um, where it used to be looking like Kano. Uh, because of the earthquake, there was a lot of crowdsourced mapping that went on and is now probably one of the best mapped uh, low-income countries in the world. Um, so we yeah, have very detailed data that can be used in, in multiple ways, but, but Haiti has still a lot of areas, as you saw with Kano, and they're not very well mapped. Um, and it's not only that data source we have, um, so this is the kind of data that was produced for Haiti, individual buildings mapped from, from crowdsourced sources. Uh, national statistics often better at GIS and mapping road networks, tracking uh, location of health facilities, villages. Uh, we have UN agencies now doing a, a good job of mapping uh, refugee camps and numbers of people in them. Uh, and even things like social media, oh, this is from Indonesia, one of the highest tweet per capita countries in the world. This is density of geo treats, uh, useful indication of where people are. Um, satellite imagery has come a long way in the last uh, decade. This is actually, you can see a video. You can now buy, you can, you know, spend a lot of money and get a satellite that's up there to point to a certain location and film, film what it sees. Um, we get very, very detailed satellite imagery. We get satellite images of the Earth at night, of land use, of topography. Um, and also have this newer data source, which 10 years ago would have been not so great. Only 10% of the population in some of these low and middle income countries are owning mobile phones. Uh, but nowadays, they're approaching similar levels to the US. Um, and also, can, uh, in the near future, we will see a, a big explosion in smartphones as well. At the moment, uh, it's not a high rate, but it will be, it will be soon. So what we can do with this kind of data is uh, utilize call detail records. So if I make a call now from here, it gets routed through the nearest mobile phone tower, which is probably on top of this building. Uh, and that's recorded by the network operator for uh, billing purposes. If I then move to another uh, block over and make another call, it's going to be routed through a different mobile phone tower. So the operator has evidence that I move from one location to another, and that can be sending a, a text, uh, making a call, receiving a call, uh, receiving a text, any communication. And so you have information of how I'm moving around, providing I'm making and communicating. And across the millions of customers that 
uh, these countries uh, and operators now have. This is a, a really rich data source, although containing a lot of biases to understand in terms of uh, urban populations more likely to own a phone, richer populations, um, but still we're getting millions of people uh, in there. Uh, not only their mobility, but changes in densities, um, very fine-grained temporal information, so every minute of every day, um, social networks, so who's calling who, um, and information also on consumption, so how much are people topping up their, their credit and how frequency do you um, So within World Pop Flowminder, uh, the way we work with this data is to set up servers within the mobile operator firewall to comply with the GSMA guidelines and remotely access those servers and no raw data ever leaves the servers and only these kind of aggregate flows, which is often what uh, people are interested in anyway. Um, and we partner with a range of organizations, so the green countries are where we've done analyses already, there's red ones are where we're talking to operators. Um, doesn't, doesn't guarantee data access in any of those necessarily. Um, so we have these three type, newer types of data um, that we now put together in a, in a giant stack of data. Um, so this can be your more traditional census data matched to boundaries, it can be the geolocated household survey data, the GIS type layers, um, extractions of settlements uh, from satellite imagery and uh, processed in different ways and uh, it can be the mobile data. So how uh, are all of these data useful for building different types of evidence to guide policy? Um, firstly, as I mentioned before, all the SDGs need uh, a denominator. Um, they're all focused on, on people, so we need this accurate subnational ongoing data on denominators. So, Firstly, how can we get there with census data and these newer data sets? Um, so this is where we uh, really introduce spatial demography. Um, we're taking the entire world, dividing up into grid squares, in this case 100 by 100 meters. Uh, each one of those grid squares, we want to estimate how many people are there in there. Um, who's there in terms of age, sex structures, but also things like literacy, access to sanitation. How have things changed through time? And long terms, but also in short terms, uh, how we move on to that population. So that's our, our goal, to get an estimate for all of those for every grid square in the world. Um, the benefits of doing this, of gridding the data and getting estimates for grid square, it's a consistent, comparable format um, so that we can integrate different data sets together. Um, so school catchment areas, health facility catchment areas, electoral boundaries are all different. Um, and this enables us to aggregate the, uh, we can take a gridded surface and aggregate it up to any, any level that we're interested in and integrate it with other data sets. So here's a gridded surface of women of childbearing age. We can overlay um, the locations for emergency obstetric and newborn care facilities and process it in, in many ways. In this case, aggregating up to an admin boundary level and estimating the numbers and uh, percentage of women who live beyond a certain and boundary and where those gaps are. So, as I said, those census counts are aggregated at quite coarse, irregular at mid unit level, uh, making integration uh, with other data sets really challenging. So, this is where we bring in this stack of data and use machine learning techniques. I won't go into the technical details so much in this talk, but to, under, to learn the relationship between these densities and the different. Uh, layers here which each give some indication of how populations dis distribute themselves on the landscapes. So if we can map out settlements, we have some indication of where people are living and where, for instance, this population here is, uh, we can then disaggregate them to this, this smaller scale. So an example here from northern Vietnam, uh, again the admin boundary counts but irregular and unusual shapes. Um, we have these different layers in the stack. This is land cover, gives us a bit more detail on where populations are likely to be within those units. Satellite uh, images of the Earth at night, give some idea of, the, of human presence. Global human settlement layers produced from satellite imagery and, and 
classifying where, where they see roof types, where they see roads. So we ultimately go from this picture to a uh, 100 by 100 meter grid square representation. Um, and that we've done this uh, across the low and middle income world, and all of these data sets are freely available to, to download from the World Park website. Um, we've done specific analysis in collaboration with the World Bank to look at change through time in Sri Lanka, uh, with the, the UN Myanmar Information Management Unit, um, and the statistics agencies across Latin, Latin America and Caribbean. Uh, and importantly for the STGs is being able to do this through time as well. So we have multiple censuses, we have projections we can make, and we can integrate in the different satellite GIS layers that change through time. So we have the coast of Kenya here for a 30-year period. And on the left, we have the change that's happened in China from 1990 to 2010. Huge growth from the countryside into the cities. Um, and our interest is also to look out to the future as well, scenarios of what might happen. Um, and here we're integrating urban growth models to look at the scenarios of different ways urban areas might grow and then integrate those in to map population distribution changes. Um, each of all the census data, of course, not only has counts, but it has age and sex structures as well. So we can use that to adjust our population services to different vulnerable groups that we're interested in. So women of childbearing age here. And within our stack of data, we also have household survey data on age-specific fertility rates at subnational scales, which can be then used to map out at births and pregnancies. So that's great. Uh, if we trust the census data, so we are essentially that's the building block and we're disaggregating to a grid square. Um, but when we're dealing with countries like Nigeria where we don't trust the census so much, uh, or Afghanistan which hasn't had a census since 1979, then uh, we need to think about different approaches. So this is where this bottom-up population estimation comes in. This is a collaboration between Oak Ridge Laboratories, UNFPA, Gates Foundation, where we are making use of very high resolution satellite imagery, so of the order of one meter, 50 centimeters, and then um, computer vision techniques to pick out where the buildings are, where the settlements are in the landscape. So this is an area of Afghanistan, and there are the individual buildings, settlements picked out. That gives us the first stage of where people are living and where they're not. Uh, it doesn't tell us how many people are in each building or what the population densities are. So here we can uh, identify different types of neighborhood that are likely to have different population densities um, and use the, again, the computer vision approaches to map out where there's different types of neighborhood here in an area. This is Kano, again, in northern Nigeria. And then we want to know what the typical population densities are in each of these types, types of uh, neighborhoods. So we undertake uh, micro census surveys much cheaper, much quicker than a full census. Um, we go to these very small areas, count how many people are in those areas, uh, and use that as training data for then a statistical model that you, again makes use of this stack of data to predict population densities. Um, so far, we can do a pretty good job. There's a, a room for improvement, um, but ultimately, we come up with maps like this of population estimates at 90 by 90 meter grid square in the absence of census data in upper and lower confidence intervals. Um, yeah, it's hard to see the numbers there, but it gives you an idea of uh, what we're estimating. Um, and ongoing work with the UNFPA, this comes from the president uh, of Afghanistan to do the same thing yeah, across the country uh, to support uh, election planning initial outputs there. So unfortunately, uh, or it's interesting that people don't stay still. And this, uh, if everyone stayed still, we might stop there. But this impacts our denominator estimates, um, the health and development metrics. It has an impact on disease dynamics, disaster relief, um, a whole range of things. And what we can do with older traditional data sources is gathered together later on migration flows as a starting point. So here's data from uh, 
census microdata mm. asking where people lived um, a year ago and those flows between different regions. We can build statistical models making use of that stack of data again to produce estimate maps and estimates of uh, subnational migration across regions. Um, that's useful for some purposes, um, but we're interested here in disease dynamics and disaster relief. We want to get to finer temporal and spatial detail. So here is where the mobile phone data can come in. So this is an example you'll see video from France, not a lower middle income country. Um, but this is where we wanted to test these analysis because we have strong statistical data to compare against the census data. And we can analyze here the mobile phone data. So we can immediately see here, this is the density of mobile phone users. It looks like a population map and correlates very strongly with the census data. So we can build a model to translate those density of mobile phone users and densities of people. That's great. Um, but the real value here is that we can have the state of every minute of every day. So we see these fluctuations of weekends, people go into the, to the countryside. Um, soon you will see here we are in June and you know that in France everybody goes <laughs> on holiday. And, okay, that's, that's a Saturday and Sunday. Fast forwarding now on to July and August, you see the cities <laughs> empty out. Uh, everybody goes to the coast here. And Sorry, and this is based on this what's the data source for this? This is just mobile mobile call data records. So, so then everybody's going to go September time, everyone is depressed and hack at work. <laughs> A detailed uh, question, is this roaming the people having the phone and logs onto the next cell tower or do the people that actively need to make a call or send a message? So it is, it does need to be communications, yeah, it's the call detail records, mm -hmm. so it's receiving or sending a communication, so again, there's problems, there's biases here, and people aren't, just have a phone but not, aren't using it at all, we don't see them. We don't see them. Uh, and would this also account for all of the holiday makers that come to France? So so all of the country, if all they of the are, yeah. If so they are just, on, you know. if they are on the network, right. so this is data from Orange. Yeah. If they're on Orange network, yeah. so there's a lot. Each country is very different. Right. Right. So in Namibia data here, where we have, we're working with an operator that has a 95 percent market share. So there we and there's 2.3 million users out of 2.5 million population. And how would you capture the population density in the countries? with low income and they do not have any mobile. So you, yeah. you, you don't know then yeah, yeah. how many I mean, are there. And for UNDP, I believe that is the most relevant. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, let's assume that you can capture that, uh, that population density in poor countries. Um, how, how UNDP projects have impacted in those poor countries in terms of electricity or access to water? Mm -hmm. basic services um, through satellites. Um, I read this somewhere uh, on the internet that without involving any people, like that dependency of the correctness of the census, you could capture whether at night, knowing that there are people, do they have light? So it, the satellite can actually capture mm -hmm. that light. Yeah. If it's dark, those people do not have access to electricity. No. So that, I think, for us would be very relevant if that is captured, that uh, at least we would know UNDP projects that were involved in funding or executing implementing projects that are dealing with implementing electricity. We have done our work well, no? Yeah, because yeah. we see, okay, how was in 2014 and in 2016, okay, we see the light. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Something, something like that would be extremely impacting for UNDP without much dependency, codependency of the governments of the, their incapability of providing us the, the data. No? Yeah, so there are, there are satellites now uh, that are detailed enough to get to the smaller rural settlements yeah. with, night, with nighttime imagery. And we've, yeah, we've done some analysis looking at seasonal patterns as well. So I haven't put it in here, but we did an analysis in Niger where as people, there's a lot 
lot of seasonal migration into the cities in the dry season as they move into the uh, edges of the cities where the migrants tend to live. You see them turn on lights, light fires, and you see the area get brighter. Right. So you know about the timing of the seasonal migration. Mm -hmm. And for us, that was to, to drive a measles model because it's when people move into the city and they have mm -hmm. and people are mixing. Yeah. Um, but there are yeah, plenty of uses. Um, the tricky thing, I think, is you know, the really rural areas where population densities are quite low, it's very small settlements, the satellites are yet, aren't yet yeah. good enough to pick out yeah. individual houses or small settlements. Mm -hmm. They to be the bigger ones, but you can, yeah, if an area has been electrified, you can yeah. generally see it. Right. Um, so this, uh, France, we were, it's a real a test that we're interested in as lower middle income countries. Uh, firstly, in this data be a useful supplement to get migration statistics. So for Namibia, we have the migration re report from the census where they asked, where did you live a year ago? Uh, we have the mobile data from pretty much the same time period. So we can look at where people are making most of their calls in one year and then the next year as they change and we can get rates of migration. Um, and it's pretty strong in correlation, so it's giving indication that this can be used as a source to get estimates of migration in between the census years. Um, our real interest is doing the same thing we did in France uh, for Namibia here. So this is population density change per square kilometer. So, so December time, huge numbers of people are leaving Windhoek for the Christmas holidays, going back to the north where their families are, are often and still, still living. Uh, then January time, the, the reverse happens, but we see, see these kind of changes in de population density all through the year. Um, but this, we've never, never had any information to try to pick up these kind of changes. Um, so how is it useful? I can probably think of many different uses. Um, for us, working with the Ministry of Health, it's understanding how health facility catchment populations change and how that has an impact on the demand for drugs for, for different services. So we can, we can now overlay these catchment populations and get our estimate of population density change and come up with uh, estimates of how those are changing throughout the year. And you see this peak in uh, different times of the year it can be very different December time, lots of people moving back to this week. So that's kind of ticks off some of the data sources in terms of getting denominators. It's not perfect. We still have a lot of problems, a lot of data gaps. Uh, how about the uh, numerators? So I'll go through a few examples here of SDG targets one, two, three, and four on poverty, uh, malnutrition, uh, sexual reproductive health care, and uh, literacy. Um, so what we can use, again, is this integration of different data sources to try and supplement and complement traditional data sources. So goal one is focused on poverty, um, pretty well-established field, especially at the World Bank, um, and it's based on small area estimation, where you're integrating together census data, where you've mapped everyone with survey data, where you've asked about poverty. Um, and used for highlighting geographic variations, understanding determinants, um, planning interventions, and monitoring change and intervention success. Um, the problem is, as we saw before, this is needing a census. And in those countries that haven't had a census for a long time, it's a problem for, for our five, six years from a census. So what we can do is make use of these GPS located household surveys again. So those characteristics measured from household surveys can be pretty strongly related to features that we can measure everywhere from our stack of data. So we can use those relationships to predict characteristics at unsampled locations, um, but it's important here to, to validate and map the uncertainty in those. So just a couple of examples here from poverty. There's some surveys that were done in these locations. We see higher rates of poverty the further we get from a major road. Uh, we see lower rates of poverty in, in urban areas over here. So those are urbanicity, distance from roads are things we can measure from geospatial data sets. From the mobile phone data, there are individual studies showing that uh, greater mobility 
uh, generally correlated with lower rates of poverty. Wider social networks generally have lower poverty rates. Large regular credit top-ups correlated with lower rates of poverty. So these are all kind of weak-ish relationships, but together, all of these can uh, help us explain quite a good proportion of the variance. So here we see uh, Bangladesh, again, GPS located survey data, where we have a measure, in this case, of poverty at each of those locations. We have our geospatial data sets, so nights of light, uh, temperature, precipitation, uh, travel time to the nearest road, or the settlement. Uh, vegetation, but we also have these mobile data sets. So this is the amount of mobility, uh, the amount of people are topping up, the, the number of SMSs that, that people are sending. And so it builds up this stack of data sets. Uh, uh, and we build statistical models, um, and go into the details here, but because we have small sample sizes, we need a sampling model, we need to build the relationship with the variance, um, and we need to account for spatial water correlation and do this in a Bayesian framework so we're accounting for uncertainty. Ultimately we come up with pretty maps uh, like this but, uh, to give us a, a good correlation against with cross-validation and against uh, small area estimation data sets. And the value of these newer data sets is again they're collected 24-7 so we have potential for updating these uh, property maps.